How do all? Welcome back to Immersion Gaming and to the extra content for the devil in me. Yes, so welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed the game because I know I did. Um, and earlier on today, I just went back on to have a look because I were curious about the the uh, coins that were that were collected throughout the game and the, the the talk of dioramas and stuff like that. And I thought to myself, actually, I think it's only fair that the people that have been on this journey with me and gone through the game also get to see the extras and spending of the coins if you want to watch it i mean obviously if you do, if you're not interested then don't watch the video do you know what i mean but if it's something that you're interested in and you want to see what i can get with the coins that we've been collecting throughout the game and from what i've also had a quick peek at there's uh, videos of the cast the actual actors that they used for the actors within the game and a bit of the making of the game and stuff like that so i thought yeah why not do a little extra video for the end of the game and to let you see the extras so here we are so without further ado let's have a look what we've got bonus features and i'm going to talk through like the interviews and things like that i'll let you watch the videos yourself like the interview there with jesse buckley who i believe is the one that played um kate uh, so yeah, I am going to talk through the interviews, I'll let you watch it and then I might have a few things to say about it afterwards, but yeah, let's uh, crack on and see what, we, uh, what we've got. My name is Kate Wilder, I've got a Masters in Criminal Psychology. I'm an investigative journalist and hope to make a difference. Hey, we're here with Jesse Buckley to talk about Supermassive's brand new game in the Dark Pictures anthology, The Devil in Me. So let's start at the beginning. Tell us a bit about the character that you play. I play a character called Kate Wilder, wow. who is a presenter um, who's part of this documentary team who are doing a show about the serial killer H.H. H. Holmes. So much she looks America's like. first serial killer confessed to 27 murders. The number grew significantly, nearly 200 lives. I'm a serial serial killer documentary <laughs> watcher. Is that is that your jam too? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll watch a serial killer documentary. Right, it's really <laughs> relaxing. Like, okay, cool, yeah, I can chill Yeah, it's kind out. of fascinating why we're all addicted to kind of those stories. We need a plan. Forget his games, traps, all that bullshit. Think about the killers we've covered. There's always a weakness. I'm not playing detective, I just want to survive. Playing detective is how we survive. So what interested you in the, in the role of Kate? Well, to be honest, I've never played a video game in my life and I had no idea what the hell the world was. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> so that was firstly why I kind of was like, oh, yeah, that sounds new <laughs> and fun. And yeah, and then I read the script and talked to Alita, who's our director, and it sounded like a really lovely thing to be part of and something new and fun. See, that's and I can't capture. believe how they create this world. That's how they capture the facial expressions. You know, like usually that. I just get a script Crazy. and it's like 70 to 100 pages long, but there's like 300 pages in one script. It's unbelievable. This is, this so as you kind of mentioned, the game has multiple branching paths, so your character could end up in any number of, uh, of situations. What's it like to film a scene, you know, multiple times with, with different endings? What I've found is like you can only be in whatever strand you're in at that time and figure out the emotion of it at that moment because then you can offer up something completely different when you go into a different strand. And it's a very like immediate experience, which I guess is also what a player will feel when they're doing it as well. So I just kind of try and keep my head in where we are right there at that moment. And if I was trying to think of what was happening in the other strand, it would be a disaster. <laughs> it must be really hard, yeah, because you kind of have this mapping, I suppose, in, in your brain of what, you know, what the outcomes could be, and then just trying to stay in that moment. It's very interesting stuff. 
so many things can happen to, to characters in, in the Dark Pictures anthologies. How do you make sure that Kate is always Kate, no matter what she's kind of faced with? Ah, uh, well, I guess before we started, we did a big read through with everybody. So it was good to kind of get a handle on who she is in the context of the environment she's in, but also the relationships that are in the world as well. It just kind of reveals itself from the script and I just kind of let her run, run, yeah. run free and see what That's so cool, <laughs> happens though. to her. Yeah, I don't think anybody has continuity in themselves. I don't anyway. It must be very <laughs> difficult. Yeah, really difficult. And that's it. I guess it's it's quite good fun to then go, OK, let's go. Let's go yeah, with this yeah. and see where we end well, up. Well, I think also Kate lives on the knife edge of she has a genuine obsession and curiosity about serial killers. So there's part of her that's kind of running towards it and part of her that's running away from it, you know, and all of them have come to be curious about H.H. H. Holmes. But also with that, you're kind of living a real life horror as you're going into this world. So come on, Charlie, what do we know about this guy? And everybody's fantastic, like, and they're all such distinctive people, you know. And they all somehow genuinely feel like a crew, you know, nice. like yeah. you kind of have the kind of riffs. Charlie is thinking. She looks a lot like a temper tantrum. And the new that. fledgling loves and then the kind of creeping horror of your life. <laughs> what are you doing with your life? Sounds you very know. familiar. Yeah, I think I've been there at 3 a.m. Um, <laughs> what is all of this? OK, so let's talk about the setting that Kate finds herself in. I've heard something about murder castles, and I'd like to know more. <laughs> um, so the production company that Kate works for, Lonet Entertainment, they get a mysterious call from a stranger <laughs> who says that he's basically made a replica of H.H. H. Holmes' murder castle. Wicked. And invites them to come and document it because he knows that they're interested in serial killers. And Lonet Entertainment, which is run by a character called Charlie, is kind of hard up, but only Charlie knows that. And so even though Kate is a bit kind of uh, resistant to go because it just feels like another kind of fuddy-duddy thing, they agree to go to this island as one last kind of hurrah. It sounds like absolutely nothing awful is going to happen. It sounds no. like a perfect setup. I'm going to have a cup of tea. Delightful. <laughs> yeah, lovely island. Very nice. Look! Years are the wine that fill the cup of time. So in the game, you've got quite a limited inventory. Which items would you take into the house if you could take anything? Hmm. I'd I'd probably take like I think look, all these mad people are just in need of a hug. <laughs> So I'd probably take a bottle of wine and just be like, mate, let's just sit down, have a glass of wine, talk about what's, what's going on Get here. Get Charlie's fags. Come here. Have let's a fag. Just calm let's down. just calm down. That's probably, that's my weapon of shame. I'd kill him with kindness. Well, you could <laughs> at least start with the wine. And if that doesn't work, you've got the bottle. So, I exactly. mean, it's, a, it's yeah, perfect. You're done. You're done. And if not, I could just drink it myself and have a lovely time. Some kind of belt with three or four of them attached. Off you go. It's all going to be fine. And if it's not fine, <laughs> You're not going to know about it. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Good choice. I think it's okay if we pour some wine? God, please do. So you've mentioned the chase scene with the uh, with the other girls. Was that fun? <laughs> that genuinely oh was God. fun to be running and scared and, and, and all of that? Yeah, it's always, okay. it's always fun. I mean, I think everything's kind of fun. <laughs> so um, thank God it's not something that happens regularly in your real life so when you mm -hmm. get to be part of something where it's super heightened and surprising and otherworldly things can happen and you've got these two excellent kind of birds beside you who are like fighting off the demons and you're genuinely scared and you're kind of doing it together it's um yeah it's brilliant move your ass go i've been around mocap i've seen mocap it fascinates me what what was that like and more so what's it going to be like to see your face in a video game to wear a mocap is like, I mean, you just feel like you've got a huge nose because you've got this cycling helmet on, but then it has a huge beak at the end <laughs> where there's a camera. And sometimes when they're putting it on, you can see the other actors already kind of lined up and it's very close. It's very scary. No, you're going to kill me. But yeah, I think it'd be super interesting. I don't know, maybe I'll look a bit better. They'll doctor me off or something. <laughs> 
<laughs> Kate's just a better version of me. Yeah, I need to be really interesting. It's going to be very cool. As far as, let's say, traditional acting versus video game acting, what were the, the differences? Was there a huge kind of difference between the two? I'd say the main difference is just the speed at which you work when you're making a video game. You still have the same intention and narratively it's the same kind of experience because you're creating characters together and you're creating a world together and our wonderful director is like interacting with us as a film director would. And also you're on a stage where there's little square boxes and there isn't a costume, you know, that's something that's added later. And all that's being caught is the emotions on your face. It must be quite intense. And when it's just focusing on your face, that must be a real, like, I don't know, uh, like intense yeah. experience. Although, to be honest, like, the scripts are, they're really good. And so I, I don't really try and think about that too much, whatever the situation. I think if I did think about it, it would be an, an awful disaster. Yeah, it may, <laughs> may change the situation so, entirely. Um, you just kind of listen and listen to everybody else that's there and, uh, and get on with it. We need a plan. Forget his games, traps, all that bullshit. Think about the killers we've covered. There's always a weakness. Are you suggesting we invite him to tea and psychoanalyze? I'm suggesting we use our heads. We play his games, we'll lose. It's our best shot. Ah. What about that then? You know what I mean when I tell you these games, if for people that aren't really aware of uh, what goes into making these games, especially these days, because you see, back in the day, they just create the characters and the NCPs and all the other characters within a game from scratch. They would just basically draw them. That would be it. Um, and that's why, if you look at some of the, a lot of the old games, the facial expressions, the lip movements and everything like that, I mean... Obviously, it's not good because they didn't have the technology back then and the, the graphics were a lot crapper back then. But there's no emotion in the faces of the characters or realism in the way they talk, the way the mouth moves and things like that. And that's why they started doing M uh, motion capture, MCAP. Um, whereas you see in that helmet she wears then with camera at front so that it captures the mouth movements, the facial expressions, everything to make it real so that it makes it more believable and more immersive so again that's what makes it like a film because in essence it is a film just a film that you're controlling with multiple different paths and endings that's why I love these games so much because rather than just sitting and watching a film which I still do I do still watch films but to me this is like the future of films because it's a film you're controlling and they're not exactly the sort of game where you need to be like the don at gaming because you're not really it's not like you've got to be really good at shooting and things like that or driving or up like that. You're just making choices. And yeah, you're moving around with joypad and that, but it's not all major. You don't have to be really a gamer to play these sort of games. It's just a film that you're controlling, basically, and that's what I love about them. So yeah, you've got to see their Kate's, uh, the actor that played Kate, um, a bit of the making where she with the suits to wear and stuff to capture the movements and everything. And even then she said how big the scripts were because there's multiple storylines. So it's not just like a normal actor would have a storyline and a character to play. She had to play every single one of them storylines, depending on which one you choose or which path you go down. So it's a lot more work in that sense as well. But yeah, let's have a look at the next one. Um, America's first serial killer. So is this about H.H. H. Holmes then? Let's see. Torture chambers, secret passageways, vats of acid, and deadly vaults. In 1895, Chicago police unearthed horrific evidence of torture and multiple murders at the sprawling castle of H.H. H. Holmes. Masquerading under the guise of caring doctor, kind husband, and prominent businessman, H.H. H. Holmes was a contemporary monster, designing his buildings solely for the disposal of human bodies. Torture Doctor, monster of 63rd Street, H.H. H. Holmes was America's first serial killer.
Just south of Chicago, the suburb of Inglewood was thriving with commerce. The train station itself had nine leading lines of railway and over 100 trains stopping there every day. No other suburb of Chicago had this luxury. Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, a pleasure to meet you. Arriving in Chicago, Holmes finds work immediately at the E.S. Holton Drugstore, located at the southeast corner of 63rd and Wallace in Englewood. Several months later, Everett Holton dies of supposed natural causes. Then Claire Holton, his wife, disappears after selling the drugstore to Holmes. Owning the drugstore, Holmes had a steady flow of cash. He would often purchase and resell goods and properties under his numerous aliases. In addition to scamming creditors, Holmes obtained his funds from other phony inventions, such as a mineral water elixir, which in reality was obtained from the city's water supply. 1888, Holmes secures a lease on the vacant property across the street from the drugstore, the southwest corner of 63rd and Wallace. It is here that Holmes will make his horrific dreams come true. He will construct a building for which the entire world will remember him. Fantasies start very young, and so what he did then was he took a step furtherance of his fantasies to make it reality and and probably if we had done a little bit of an investigation back then we would have seen things like his plans but not just plans for a building because we'd expect to see architectural plans but plans for his torture rooms for the suburb of Englewood the building Holmes is erecting at 63rd and Wallace is a massive construction project day after day Passers-by stop to gaze at the spectacle of the many laborers working together to create a magnificent new edifice in their neighborhood. Englewood residents were so impressed with the massive building that they named it the Castle. From its outward appearance, it seemed rather normal. But like the duality of homes, the exterior and interior of the building were extremely different. Holmes himself was the architect of the building. He was the only one who knew its design. There was this constant turnover of workers on the building. He would hire a mason to put in a wall and then fire the guy, or hire somebody to put in part of a staircase and then fire him. And uh, there, there seemed to be several, several very sinister reasons behind that. One was he managed not to pay a lot of these people because he was always claiming that they were doing incompetent work. But the other, much more insidious reason was that no one except him really had a clear idea of what the structure of the interior of the house was. He had a huge bank vault installed in one of the rooms. And the way he did it was he put the vault in first while the building was under construction and then built the room around it. And he bought this thing on credit and then refused to pay for it. The bank company said they were going to repossess the vault. Holmes said, well, you know, come on in and do, but if you damage my building in any way, I'm going to sue you for everything you're worth. The bottom floor of the castle housed a pharmacy, jewelry store, barber shop, restaurant, and a blacksmith shop. Behind this innocent facade was a gothic house of horrors designed by the mind of a monster. The third floor seemed innocent enough, containing rented rooms, legitimate offices, and Holmes's own bedroom. But it was the second floor that contained 35 rooms, many specifically designed as killing chambers. Disorienting, unsuspecting victims 
the labyrinthian construction contained numerous staircases and doorways that led nowhere. For a quick method of hiding a victim's body, a concealed greased chute and trapdoor led directly into the basement of the castle. I didn't realise it was a full uh, documentary. This is good though. I mean, it tells you a bit about the real the real guy that this all actually happened, you know what I mean? It makes the game even creepier, in my opinion. But like I said, I won't talk over it, I'll let you enjoy it and we'll talk about it afterwards. The basement held the most terrifying rooms, resembling a medieval torture dungeon. Acid vats, quick lime pits, and a crematorium disguised as a glass-bending furnace were Holmes's favorite methods of immediate body disposal. After cleaning and mounting their bones, Holmes would profit from his victims by selling their skeletons to local medical schools and universities. Holmes would make a killing in Chicago, financially and literally. May 1st, 1893, the world's Colombian exposition is open to the public in Chicago. Spanning 600 acres, sprawled out along beautiful Lake Michigan, the magnificent fair is a monumental sight to behold. Over 20 million people from around the world would attend the dazzling World's Fair between May 1st and October 30th, 1893. Holmes utilizes the World's Fair as the perfect opportunity to capitalize on his demented design of the castle. Located only a few miles from the World's Fair, Holmes's castle was perfect lodging for tourists. Holmes decides to rent rooms to visitors of the fair. He entirely renovates the upper floors of the castle, bringing in the most modern furnishings and luxuries, all purchased on credit which Holmes had no intention of repaying. In addition to placing newspaper ads for rooms to rent, Holmes visited the fair with several of Benjamin Peitzel's children, preying on elderly women who flaunted their wealth, making sure he invited them back to the castle for a warm night's stay in a soft bed. They're not calling their relatives, telling them where they're at. They just know that they're going to Chicago to see the Columbian Exposition perfect victims because they're unknown in the city. Their relatives, wherever they came from, know that they were coming to Chicago and they never came back. Now, how do you start to find them? They don't even know where they stayed. Perfect, easy victims. I'm sure some of them got in and out of his place with no problem. And others, they walked in and they never checked out. 
Some of the rooms had been completely lined with asbestos to make them soundproof. Hidden in Holmes' office was a master control panel which connected to gas lines leading into airtight sleeping chambers. Holmes would lead his victims into the rooms, lock them in, and turn on the gas, asphyxiating them while watching their demise. Let me out! Holmes, let me out, please! Holmes! Holmes! Holmes, please! Holmes! At the height of the World's Fair, Holmes masterfully juggles his castle businesses, renting rooms, dodging creditors, selling skeletons, and attending to the needs of the many women in his life. I have had many young ladies in my employ, most of whom are still living in and about Chicago, whose parents and friends know only too well that far from being their seducer, I have done much to materially help them in their narrow lives. Being a personable, attractive young doctor and businessman, Holmes won the hearts of many women throughout his life. At one point, Holmes managed to secretly have three wives, each never knowing of the others. In 1890, Julia Connor became Holmes' employee and mistress, living at the castle with her daughter Pearl. When she became pregnant and demanded marriage, Holmes agreed on the condition that she allowed him to perform an abortion on her. She agreed. Neither Julia nor her daughter Pearl were ever seen again. Just a week later, Holmes sold a clean, articulated skeleton to the Hahnemann Medical College for nearly $200. In 1892, Holmes acquired another mistress, Emmeline Sigrand, and employed her as private secretary. Holmes sent Emmeline into the vault to retrieve some papers and sealed it, suffocating her to death. Several weeks later, the University of Chicago acquired a female skeleton from Dr. Holmes. In 1893, Minnie Williams became Holmes's new private secretary and eventually his mistress. Minnie was the beneficiary of a property in Fort Worth, Texas, valued at over $40,000. Holmes murdered Minnie and her younger sister, Nanny, after having Minnie sign over the Fort Worth property to him. In 1894, Georgiana Yoke became Holmes' third wife. He married her under the name Henry Mansfield Howard, like his other legitimate wives, Georgiana lived out her entire life. On July 19, 1895, Chicago police enter the Holmes Castle. The world would now learn of the horrors that the castle had kept secret for so very long. As disoriented detectives and police search the upper floors of the castle, the true depths of Holmes's evil were waiting in the basement. Among the death devices in the basement of the castle, investigators find piles of mixed human and animal bones, bloody women's undergarments, 
and a wooden dissection table saturated with dried blood. Chicago police were inundated with names of people reported missing from the World's Fair. Fifty missing people were eventually traced to the Castle of Horrors. The evidence, blood and bones found in the basement posed a problem for 19th century criminal investigative techniques. It was very difficult to go and identify even the bones as being human in origin because with the very small fragments you didn't have enough of the identifying characteristics to be able to make that ID. The world is now calling Holmes the monster of 63rd Street, torture doctor, and the modern Bluebeard. Overnight, Holmes transforms from arch swindler to arch fiend. A Chicago journalist calls Holmes a multi murderer. The Holmes case generated this incredible amount of na national attention, and really international attention. Really, in his own time, and in America, Holmes was much more notorious and more widely known than Jack the Ripper, who was a contemporary of his. Then as now, people were very, very fascinated to sort of visit the sites of these terrible crimes. And his castle became a kind of tourist site. And there were various people who were going to want to take it over and turn it into a kind of murder museum. And then, just before some impresario was about to make it again into this tourist attraction, it just burnt, it burnt down. Somebody burnt it down. I mean, it could have been, who knows, some outraged citizen who didn't want this to become some very morbid tourist attraction. Holmes' trial was kind of the O.J. Simpson trial of the day. It just generated this huge amount of publicity. The case had become a kind of national obsession. Of course, there wasn't CNN or Court TV back then, so it couldn't be covered quite as relentlessly. But it was covered very, very extensively. There were true crime books and pamphlets and all kinds of stuff. And Holmes himself had become a sort of folk figure almost, you know, the sort of national boogeyman. courtroom fills for the final verdict to be read. Holmes becomes extremely nervous when not one of the jury members looks at him. In his entire criminal career, this is the moment Holmes never believed would occur. He is found guilty of murder in the first degree. Herman Webster Mudgett, alias H. H. Holmes, would be hanged on May 7th, 1896. was in jail awaiting the execution of the sentence, he was made an offer by William Randolph Hearst, uh, supposedly for a significant amount of money to provide his confessions. Holmes, who had already issued at a half a dozen completely self-contradictory versions of, of his crimes, clearly at this point felt he had nothing to lose. He was going to die anyway. In this confession, he did a complete about-face and portrayed himself as the worst monster who ever lived. He just basically confessed 
to every crime anybody had ever suspected him of and threw in a few more for good measure. He's reliving the fantasies after the fact now. He's reliving the fantasies of things that he did. She was very willing to do this and prepared to leave the vault upon completing the letter, only to learn that the door would never again be opened until she had ceased to suffer the tortures of a slow and lingering death. The partial excavation in the walls of this room found by the police was caused by Latimer's endeavoring to escape by tearing away the solid brick and mortar with his unaided fingers. I closed the door and turned on both the oil and steam to their full extent. In a short time, not even the bones of my victim remained. It was the footprint of Nanny Williams that was found upon the painted surface of the vault door, made during her violent struggles before death. Only one difficulty presented itself. Sorry about that. The control it was necessary itself. for me to kill him in such a manner that no struggle or movement of his body should occur. I overcame this difficulty by first binding him hand and foot, and having done this, I proceeded to burn him alive by saturating his clothing and his face with benzene and igniting it with a match. As soon as he had ceased to breathe, I cut his body into pieces, and by the combined use of gas and corn cobs, proceeded to burn it with as little feeling as though it had been some inanimate object. I immediately took them to the Vincent Street house, and compelled them to get within the large trunk, through the cover of which I had made a small opening, and ended their lives by connecting the gas with the trunk. Then came the opening of the trunk, and the viewing of their little blackened and distorted faces. Then the digging of their shallow graves in the basement of the house. The ruthless stripping off of their clothing, and the burial without a particle of covering save the cold earth. I am convinced that since my imprisonment, I have changed woefully and gruesomely from what I was formerly in feature and figure. My features are assuming a pronounced satanical cast. My head and face are gradually assuming an elongated shape. I believe fully that I am growing to resemble the devil. Nutcase. I actually thought it was going to be becoming the devil. Well... On the gallows, just before he died, he recanted. He claimed that the confession that he had published was a complete fabrication. The extent of my wrongdoing in the taking of human life consists in contriving the killing of two women that have died at my hands as a result of criminal operations. That is all I have to say. H.H. H. Holmes is hanged on Thursday, May 7th, 1896, just nine days before his 35th birthday. At 10.25 a.m., he is pronounced dead. He was very concerned that after his execution, his body would be dug up either by medical men seeking to dissect his brain and find out what made him tick, or, or just ghoulish sort of, you know, souvenir hunters. And he requested that he be buried within a big slab of concrete, which he actually was. One of the things about Holmes is that nobody knows for sure how many people he actually killed. Um, although in my researches, which were pretty, I feel, thorough and, and extensive, it, it seemed very clear to me that he murdered at least nine people. 
There have been stories that he killed 50, 100, countless people, particularly in Chicago at the height of the World's Fair. How many people did Holmes actually murder? Most likely, no one will ever know. Holmes and the many other people that came in contact with him are long gone, having taken the answers with them to their graves. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world. And he has been with me since. I didn't expect a, a full H. H. Holmes documentary. Um, good, like, I'm, I mean, it's, it gives some context to the game, like, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? But I just didn't expect it, in all honesty. Um, but yeah, there you go. So, as I was telling you about when, I, when I first started playing the game, it, it's, it's based on a real person. This guy was a complete loony tomb. You know what I mean? He, he, I mean, they, that guy said there are nine victims. That's the only. The, ones that they can definitely 100% pin on him without a doubt they, they reckon it's all anyway up to 200 people that he killed because it, it didn't just start then it goes all the way back to his childhood I mean there's other documentaries you can watch on YouTube where it'll go right into detail about his life and it goes all the way back to his childhood they reckon he, he killed his first um, his first victim it could have been when he was around 15 or something like that I think it was so yeah the tally they reckon it could go anywhere up to 200 people so yeah Basically, the guy was a complete loony to him. So, yeah, that was a good bit of bonus uh, footage there. Um, HHM documentary. So, what's next? Let's have a look. The Making of the Murder Castle. Short documentary on the designing of the Murder Castle. Right, so here we go. Let's have a look at this one. So, what do we know about this guy? He's rich, he's a recluse, he's obsessed with H.H. Holmes. We're going to a property he inherited from a relative. Some of the rooms are full recreations from the murder castle. Dumet has blueprints, documents, artifacts. Totally sane, I'm sure. There are various elements we knew we wanted to explore when designing the hotel. From developing areas and set pieces that generated a constant sense of uneasiness and tension to memorable trap rooms that force the player into frantic life and death decisions. I'm so sorry. We took a lot of inspiration from Holmes' original murder castle as we wanted to capture the way that Holmes' castle was created to disorientate and confuse his victims. Welcome to the World's Fair Hotel. As cunning as Demet is, not everything in his castle runs like clockwork anymore. His operation has become so vast that he can't maintain everything and the Lonic crew have turned up at just the right time to exploit that. The production design for the hotel needed to reflect the original design, utilising a Victorian style facade and castle turrets, interiors with ornate mouldings and panelling, being made larger to accommodate the game's intention to be used as a vast labyrinth to create fear and horror. This included the hidden rooms, sliding walls, trap doors and secret basements, but with extra central monitor rooms and death rooms all hidden from the guests, providing multiple layers and multiple levels to explore and veiling the horror within. Special attention was given to the design of the areas such as the lobby, the bar area and the dining rooms to provide an authentic, believable Victorian hotel, bringing a feeling of magnitude and foreboding to intimidate the player. Guys? Is that you? The hotel guest rooms were designed to be opulent yet aged in keeping in style with furnishings and fittings, yet having additional modern electronic window shutters installed to trap the victims. Secret observation rooms were also built adjoining with hidden doorways to enter. Corridors were cleverly designed to include mechanical sliding walls hidden within the Victorian framework, used to change the layout of the labyrinth throughout the hotel. 
Fuck. The murder inventions designed within locations included the suffocation and crushing rooms, furnaces and acid baths. The monitor room was a newly constructed area, deep within the core of the hotel. This room allowed Demet the full control of the labyrinth and its workings. In The Devil and Me, we make use of a range of mechanics new to the Dark Pictures series to help convey the unsettling mood and threat of the hotel. With an expanded focus on exploration, the player spends a lot of the time exploring the hotel's labyrinthian corridors, and as each character revisits a shared area, the feel of it changes. Each character has their own unique light source. Erin and Jamie, as the practical sound and lighting techs, have fairly straightforward torches, with Erin's directional microphone providing an additional small light when in use. Mark, the camera operator, has his camera flash, lifting the darkness in short bursts and providing mini jump scares as the player suddenly sees something out of the gloom. Kate lights her way around with her makeup mirror, providing a small amount of light to fumble through the corridors. And then Charlie's sole light source is his own cigarette lighter, casting the hotel in its flickering orange light and barely really lighting anything at all. Jamie! Over here. Each character experiences these shared areas differently through this, adding to the sense of the familiar hotel rooms changing with each visit. It's amazing. The Allen Hotel was originally built in the 1890s. It was converted into a spa later on until it was abandoned and finally chosen by Demet for his murder playground. <gasps> Some parts had been restored, like the rooms the characters stay in and the lush lobby and bar areas on the first floor. We work closely with concept art and art direction to create distinct colour palettes and ornate assets that made those areas more inviting while still leaving something unsettling about their imperfections. But elsewhere we could show the hotel and spa's original treatment rooms and the indoor pool which had fallen into disrepair and other thematically different places. Our second challenge was getting into Dumet's head. We knew that he was supposed to be a very meticulous man, he's the sole architect of this place and proud of his creations. Some rooms are deliberately left in disrepair, we created them with the base layers showing and we scattered building equipment around to tell the narrative that Dumet still has plans for them. Others he had completely purpose built, that's where we used the mix of old brick and breeze block materials next to each other to create contrast. And on top of that, there are traps everywhere. Some of the most interesting areas to create were the ones which were supposed to be off-limits to hotel guests. We wanted to show the stark contrast of his personal space versus the one he hunts people in. The team went as far to even design Demet's handwriting, and we used that on boards and documents to show more of his personality. There's storytelling in every small detail. Lighting in The Wind Me is a bit different from the previous dark picture games. Since we have more explorations and more playable areas in the game for players to freely explore, we had to slightly adjust the way we used to do lighting by adding some new stuff, such as adding more guide lights in the environment for direction, or add some interactable light fixtures that you can trigger on and off by walking closer or away from them. So there are four types of lighting styles in the hotel. The first one is the regular hotel areas where everyone should feel safe and cozy. We try to use more bright, warm color lights with different elegant light fixtures. And the second one is the areas that are either under constructions used as Dumas workshop or places only lit by moonlight or should be pitch black. We used cooler temperature lights or even blue lights for these kind of areas with very low light intensity and very heavy volumetric fog to enhance the claustrophobic vibe and to elevate the tension. So the third one would be the control room where Dumet watches and controls all the activities in the hotel. We want this room to be especially bright like an industrial warehouse with a cool eerie mood to separate it from the other rooms. And the last one is all the rooms that are designed to be slaughter stages. Killing is like creating art to Dumet, and he wants all his artworks to be presented epically with audiences, classical music, and beautiful lighting setup. So in these areas, unlike the others that have more neutral color in the lights, 
we tend to artificially light these areas with either theatrical lighting or use high contrast saturated lighting setup so that we know something is going to happen. If we don't do something, both of them will die, Mark. We wanted to provide players with a truly realistic historical sonic experience whilst inside the murder castle. We researched multiple properties and buildings built within the same period as the original Chicago murder castle. Authentic door foley and sound effects elements were high on our priority list. We recorded multiple door openings, closings, handles, rattles and squeaks. Throughout pre-production, we had seen all the variations of emotion characters would be displaying when using the doors. Ranging from calmness through to blind panic and incensed rage, all these emotions could be channeled into the performance we recorded. Another element of the soundscape we went into considerable detail recording was floorboard and stair creaks. Virtually every step we took provided us with a distinctive and unique sound. We recorded these creaks in three states, running, walking and walking slow. To further add to this, as the characters climb higher inside the Met's murder castle, the creaks will become more frequent as you enter unfinished rooms, exposed walkways, and the structural integrity of the hotel becomes more dangerous and unstable. In terms of the music, we chose various 19th century pieces of classical music and opera to accompany the murder scenes. These would have been the pop music tracks around the time of H.H. H. Holmes, providing a cognitive link between past and present. Classical music and opera accompanies a lot of the murder scenes, uh, often playing through a gramophone or a tannoy, which is then fed back through our bespoke impulse responses to allow the music to naturally echo throughout the cellars and corridors of the what? space. What is this? We took a similar approach as well with the abstract sound design, including nods to classic horror films with really discordant, unnerving piano impacts and, and bowed metal interspersed with electromagnetic recordings, synths and ultra-modern distortion to provide that juxtaposition and, and that link through time uh, between the historical setting and the modern day story. <laughs> Designing the hotel as a play space presented different challenges than previous Dark Pictures games. We've gone from quite open environments in House of Ashes and Little Hope to a more enclosed one with the hotel. The ability to revisit previous environments at different points in the story with different layouts and different emotional states meant that we had to collaborate very closely with each other to make sure we designed each area to cater for every requirement. We had to think how a lit corridor would feel if multiple characters were roaming around it, versus the same corridor drenched in darkness with just a singular player character. Empty hotels are inherently oh, eerie, and it allowed us to play with the idea of liminal space to try and create a murder castle that felt uncanny, with something that felt truly unique. It's me! Get in here! Jamie? Thank God. And there you go. You see, I think this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this extras uh, video because although people know that, well, people that are interested in it anyway know that video games are, are a lot of work and take years to do, but even for me, someone that does understand exactly just how much work goes in, to watch things like that and realise just how much detail and work goes into it. Like things that you wouldn't even think about, like the floorboard creaks, the door handle turnings, and all that has to be recorded and played with and looked at as in the context of the situation of the level that you're in. Like you said, is it a panic situation or is it you're trying to be quiet and creeping down and slowly turning down and things like that? Just things you wouldn't ever think of. But the amount of work that goes in, this is why they take years to make, and this is the appreciation that I'm trying to convey in some of these videos, is just to, uh, the amount of effort and time and work that goes into these games, it's, it's unreal. Cause it, and, that, and that is all the little details like that that immerse you in the game and that get that emotional reaction out of you. Because believe me, when I'm playing these games, I actually do panic or get excited or adrenaline starts going if I'm being chased by them and stuff like that. And that's, it's all these little details like that that make that a reality. Which again is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this extra video to just show you a slice of that and give you an idea of what goes into it. Um, it's saying this one's locked. Murder with Morello part one. Can I unlock it? Now I don't know why that's locked. I don't know if I just unlock by finding silver framed secrets. Oh well that's probably why then I didn't find something to unlock it. 
watch part two of the murder with Morello podcast. Well, let's have a look, see what this is about. Oh my God, that's gruesome. Right? Investigating violent crime is gruesome. It's stressful and it can get to you. Agent Monday started seeking professional help. We have here a transcript from one of the sessions Monday attended with Dr. Isabella Garcia. Michelle, will you grab that piece of paper over there and read it for us? Sure. Psychological assessment conducted by Dr. Isabella Garcia. Patient name, Monday, Hector. Behavioral observation. Hector arrived at our scheduled appointment 24 minutes late. Once we sat down and began the session, he struggled to maintain eye contact. He found it difficult to articulate his feelings and was terse and guarded throughout. Hector has been working long hours and, as a result, isn't sleeping well. Hector spoke about his recently deceased mother and displayed evidence that he hasn't yet fully come to terms with her death. I strongly recommended a course of antidepressants, but he is resistant to this idea, believing that it would have a detrimental effect on his capability with regards to his current investigation. Hector describes his work in immaculate detail, and contrary to earlier in the session, his thought content is both coherent and logical. He is displaying an unhealthy obsession with his work, but his recent bereavement may be the underlying issue. So what do we know? Agent Monday is at his lowest point. He's struggling with the case, and he's being guided in his actions by a convicted mass murderer. This one is really going to give our listeners something to remember. It's the fourth and final meeting of Agent Hector Monday and the Beast of Arkansas, Manny Sherman. Hold on to your hats. This one is going to get tasty. You want to know what it means to be a killer? You ever been to the art museum downtown? They got this painting by a guy, I forget his name, famous painter. He did portraits of slaughtered cows hanging on hooks. You take a normal person to a slaughterhouse and they will puke their guts out. You make it into a painting and suddenly it's art. There's no difference between the two. Not really. Don't look at me like that. You know I'm right. You get it. I know you get it. You got to do something that matters. Make people feel something they've never felt before. Shatter the illusion that any of us are really in control. Think of the most profound thing you've ever done. The most beautiful thing you've ever created. And I promise you, it's nothing compared to watching the life bleed out of someone. To see the fear in their eyes. To feel them pawing at you for release. To hear them pleading, begging. That moment when someone realizes they are at their end. That's when you feel it. That's true art. That's what you have to be. An artist. A sculptor. An architect. I see the gleam in your eye, Agent Monday. You're not fooling me. Look! Ah, look at you now, huh? Am I gonna be your first? Well, come on then, huh? I'm right here. This room is soundproof. You don't even have to wait for a plane to fly overhead. There you are. I see you now. Oh, not bad. Not bad at all. Their hands. 
hands can feel good, huh? But the blade makes for such a prettier picture. Uh, you've got potential, Agent Monday. If you truly want to be an artist. Monday flipped? And what was all that stuff about being an artist? That's how Sherman saw himself. He was a killer. Which is why we covered him in episode 117, Michelle. Okay. Just listen to this. On June 17, 1998, neighbors reported hearing screams coming from Agent Monday's apartment. I've managed to get hold of the actual audio from the body mic worn by the first responder who answered the call. Chicago Police! Mr. Monday, this is Chicago Police. Can you open the door, please? Mr. Monday, I'm Officer Stanley with Chicago Police Department. Can you hear me, sir? Agent Monday. Fuck! Fuck! Oh! Uh... Dispatch, this is Officer Stanley. I, I need assistance at 8 West 50th Street, requesting immediate backup. I'm in Agent Monday's apartment. There's, there's blood everywhere, and, and a body. I need immediate support. I think... So Mundy was actually investigating his own murders. He was the shoeshine killer. I bet you didn't see that one coming. Did they get him? You're racing ahead now, Michelle. Let's hear the moment Officer Richie Martinez cornered Agent Monday. All units, this is dispatch. Be on the lookout for a male suspect believed to be the shoeshine killer. Suspect is FBI Special Agent Hector Monday. He may be armed and is highly dangerous. Dispatch. This is Officer Martinez. I found Monday's car, requesting backup. Officer Martinez, what's your location? A warehouse on Park Avenue, Fulton River. Looks abandoned. Officer Martinez, backup on its way. Hold your position. Copy that. Shit! He's seen me! Officer Martinez, hold your position. No! Ah! Ah! Shit! We have a situation. Dispatch, the building's on fire. Fire department on their way. He's still in there. You read me. Copy. He's still in there. Monday got sloppy with his car? Maybe. Or maybe Monday wanted that police officer to find it. Well, I don't get it. He knew the roads were being watched. His car would have been pulled over the moment he left the city. So he needed another way out. Let's hear how Chicago AM reported events in their morning bulletin. Good morning, Chicago. We begin today with some breaking news. Chicago police today confirmed the body of a man found in a fire at an abandoned warehouse in the Fulton River District to be that of missing FBI agent Hector Monday. Monday has been identified as the shoeshine killer whose recent killing spree struck fear into the hearts of locals in and around Chicago. A spokesperson for Chicago PD confirmed Monday murdered four victims, including yesterday evening police officer Patrick Stanley, a dedicated veteran of 22 years. The fire was brought under control shortly before 5 a.m. this morning. The body recovered at the scene was burnt beyond recognition, but police identified Monday from dental records. So, that was the end of Special Agent Hector Monday. Whoa, hold your horses. You think it's so difficult to forge dental records? Monday was a teeth puller, remember? He probably had a collection. And he was a highly motivated FBI field agent. You think he faked his own death? I don't know. But this case has one more twist. On February 16th, 2001, there was an incident at the Chicago PD Evidence Management Facility. Michelle, can you grab that report next to you and read it out for our listeners? At 0600 hours, I, Officer Frank Hooper, discovered that one or multiple individuals had gained unauthorized access to the evidence room at 1612 West State Street. Among the missing items were assets recovered from the apartment of former FBI agent Hector Monday, 
including books, clothes, notes, surgical tools, and dental equipment. Wait. Keep reading. We are currently running with the theory that this was the direct result of souvenir hunters looking for a piece of memorabilia from the case. End of report. Interesting, right? He set the whole thing up? In that list of stolen items, reportedly, was a piece of paper with a list of names. Aliases? What are you saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm just putting it out there. You think Agent Monday is still at large? <laughs> well, if he is, maybe he can call into the show and let us know. Our lines are open. Well, that's all we have time for for this podcast. We're taking a short break for a certain anniversary trip next week. But we'll be back after that for more murderous content to delight you all. Until then, this has been Michelle Morello. And I've been Joe Morello. Thank you for listening. Please like this podcast and hit the subscribe button, or I'll send Michelle over to brutally kill you all. I have an axe at the ready. This is Joe Morello saying be safe, don't split up, and keep looking behind you. Good night. Good night. Right, so that explains. Remember when they got uh, met um, at the ferry by supposed Domet, the black guy who we've just been listening to then on that podcast? Obviously, it wasn't Domet. Domet wore Monday's alias, basically. Um, he was a podcaster. That was his podcast that we've just listened to then. So, obviously, that is why he got invited to the murder castle before they got invited, the characters that we played. So he, they were the first, or well, maybe not the first group, but the group before us to go and get murdered, basically, at the uh, at the murder castle. Um, and that's the reason why, because he was a podcaster. So I remember reading in one of the letters that we found within the uh, murder castle that were uh, written to him, Morello, um, inviting him and five people, well, five people in general, including him, um, to the murder castle so that's when he took I think it was his brother his kids and whoever probably heard that he was just talking to them on podcast with them so yeah that that explains that why he was there before us and then he played the part of Dumet didn't he to get us to go there and then we saw him out of window then running for his life with his daughter that were left I'm guessing those were the only two that survived so yeah that explains a few things that were good that so the last bit is dioramas and I'm guessing this is what um, we're, we're getting the coins for so let's have a look yeah because look we can I mean they aren't going to go through this this is just unlocking pictures of characters for the game I mean I'm not going to start buying all them uh, we saw them all within the game, didn't we? So, there's no point, basically. <laughs> I mean, I'll unlock them, but that's all you get. So, you can, like, zoom in on it and have a look and all that sort of stuff but I'm not going to go through all that way There's, it's pointless that but saying that some of you guys might want to see it so I'll quickly do it just in case you're uh, wanting to see it um, that's the quartet that sang the uh, songs. Then we've got the barman. Where Charlie were attacking the uh, Cigarette vending machine. And then we've got Sherman, the uh, 
serial killer that Monday were interviewing and the one that sparked off Monday's obsession with H.H. Holmes and killing people and all that. Then we've got the uh, guy that got hit with a scythe. Well, it turned out that he was a mannequin, I think, anyway. We found him in basement afterwards, didn't we? Then we've got uh, oh, where he got thingy dump boat with anchor. Still didn't kill him though, did it? Chopped. Oh, wait police officer on it where he chopped his arm off. It would have been mental if it had a still fired gun as it were dropping. And a muscle spasm on trigger. And then we've got fast Oh this is bodies that were in um I don't know if it's that uh guy who did podcast if it were his brother then it looked like him but he managed to get away didn't he so it can't have been him but it could have been his brother unless they didn't manage to get away then he got them on the other side at ferry or something because that's him and his daughter by the look of it so yeah i'm guessing he didn't manage to get away then he got them at the other side when ferry got to the other beach or either that or they were on ferry That's locked. Oh, this will win. Uh, oh, we ain't got enough, no. I thought I'd have had enough to get them all. I guess not. So that's it, yeah, those are dioramas we could afford. So, that's your extras, uh, your bonus features on The Devil in Me. Um, What else have we got? Collectibles, what's this? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, going through all them. They're just all um They're just all secrets and that. I'm not going through all them again. We saw all them in the game, didn't we? So What's this? Ah, oh, this is just showing us. What the other games was that we've been through all them, aren't we? So that's it, peeps. Um, like I say, it was just a little extra video of this, just to show you um, the collectibles and uh, spend the coins that you saw me uh, collecting throughout the game. No, serious, like. But to be honest, I didn't expect to get a full uh, HH Home documentary out of it as well. So <laughs> I suppose that was a little bonus. But yeah, thanks for joining me. Um, I've uh, just done the trailer for my next game as well, which was one that I completely forgot about. It's uh, made by the same guys that made this um, Supermassive Games, and it's called The Quarry. It only came out last year, uh, and I completely forgot. And I can't believe I forgot, to be honest, because when I watched the trailer of it, uh, I was really excited to play it, because it does look absolutely brilliant. looks all right, laugh. Um, so yeah, I've just done the trailer for that. I'll be putting that on at some point, probably today or tomorrow. Um, and then I'm going to crack on with playing that because I'm dying to play it. So yeah, thanks for joining me on this, peeps. If you want to, uh, as always, if you want to support us at Immersion Gaming, uh, the main way, as always, to do that would be to uh, like the video with the thumbs up button underneath, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I upload a new video. But apart from that, thank you very much for joining me i hope you've enjoyed it and i will speak to you all very soon bye <laughs>